In the early to mid 2010s, Chicago Drill was making some serious waves. Chief Keef had blown up and become a viral sensation. There were new drill rappers popping up left and right, and the genre seemed like it was going to take over the industry. And for a little bit, it did, as at one point, the entire rap world was obsessed with Chirac Drill. However, years later, not a single drill rapper is really doing great, other than a couple who don't rep the genre at all, but rather try to hide it from the past. So what happened to Chicago Drill, and why isn't it still around today? My name is Rashad Fashir, and this is the fall of Chicago Drill rap's deadliest genre. However, before we discuss the downfall, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. And before that, we have to define what Chicago drill even is. The word drill is defined by violently fighting or retaliating, but the music is defined by crime, violence, and hardships that are reflected in music. Over the years, drill music has traveled from city to city, country to country, but Chicago would be the birthplace of the drill sound. In the early 2010s, drill music would originate in the south side of Chicago, during a colossal wave of violence. Although it would be horrible for the city, everything has a silver lining, and the music that would come out of it would be just that. Although there were some notable rappers that came before, the real beginning of Chicago Drill that we all know started with a teenager, Keith Cozart, better known as Chief Keith. Keith was only 16 years old when he started to gain popularity in Chicago for making a series of low budget music videos while on house arrest, and his come up was special. After releasing just two mixtapes, his hit single I Don't Like was co signed by Kanye West, who later came out with the remix of the track featuring Big Sean. Pusha T and Jadakiss. This would immediately skyrocket Chief Keef's career further into the masses. But it wouldn't just bring him up though. In the midst of Keef's rise to fame in 2011 and 2012, the spotlight on Chicago hip hop was larger than ever before. Other prominent Chicago rappers started to capture the attention of the nation as well. And from 2012 to 2015, many other Chicago artists signed record deals with major record labels. Artists such as Lil Durk, Lil Reese, G Herbo, Lil Bibby, and the great and late Fredo Santana helped popularize the sound, and there were countless others who'd become quite popular as well. However, today, only the names I mentioned are known. Everyone else is gone. But just 10 years ago, Chicago Drill was once the most buzzing scene in rap. Where did everyone go? Well, the first reason why Chicago Drill dissipated so fast was the reason it came up, crime. You see, many of the rappers who we're speaking about were involved as well. Rappers and cliques would not only go head to head in their raps, but also in the streets. One of them being No Limit, the group G Herbo and Juice World were associated with, versus KTS. No Limit Muskegon Boys, or just the No Limit Gang, is a GD based gang with multiple stars that were repping it. Early on in the drill scene, G Herbo and Lil Baby were the faces of the crew. Years later, they'd take Juice World under their wing. NLMB are two sets that are clicked up. No Limit is a Black P-Stone set, while the Muskegon Boys are Renegade GDs. Both sets were struggling inside the mean streets of Chicago, so they decided to link up as they'd be stronger together. The set was also coined with the acronym Never Leave My Brothers. G Herbo and Lil Baby were part of a younger generation that stepped up after the OGs were deceased or locked up, and the structure of the set had fallen apart. So when they joined as just young men, the set was already neck deep in pre-existing beef. A few separate sets decided to do the same and would join forces. Affiliates from both Lakeside and Black Mob would join to create KTS, also known as to Survive. And both of these gangs would go head on. The beef started after KTS affiliate Lil Pez was shot in the head. Although no one was arrested, KTS suspected that No Limit Gang was behind the murder. And this would start a very long and violent gang war. KTS Vaughn and his brother KTS were big shots in their sets, a rapping duo that were making local noise through their music and violence. Vaughn was a known demon in the streets, catching his first murder in 2011 and going on to commit a few more murders till his demise in 2015. In 2012, he allegedly opened fire at a liquor store, hitting six No Limit members, killing two and injuring four. G Herbo was one of the injured members, and from then on, the beef would go to a new level. The violence began to kick off between the sets, and it began with KTS. KTS Vaughn and Dre caught an NLMB member, Cairo and McDonald's. Cairo would go on to be a staple member of the crew, a lot of the times being by Juice World's side. Cairo was caught at a McDonald's when KTS members would urge him to diss one of the No Limit Gang fallen members. After he wouldn't say it, Dre punched him so hard that he broke his jaw. Vaughn and Dre would then scurry off after a No Limit gang flashed their gun. Time would go by, but just a few months later, G Herbo and his close friend Mad Max would allegedly murder a KTS affiliate named Lolo. Rumors say that Mad Max had shot him in the chest while Herbo shot his friend in the ankle as he ran away. 
Lola would pass away on the way to the hospital, and the neighborhood would change from Lakeside to Lola World, meaning KTS members would seek revenge. And one day they did. While NLMB members were celebrating Baby's brother's birthday, G Herbo and a friend were shooting dice when their good friend Kobe decided to walk home. Kobe was walking past the same McDonald's that Cairo was pressed in. Shots started to ring off. G Herbo and No Limit Gang actually heard the blasts from a distance but couldn't get to the scene in time. No one was arrested for the murder, but everyone knew who was responsible for it. And G Herbo would drop his classic mixtape, Balling Like I'm Kobe, as a tribute to his fallen friend. KTS Vaughn would double down and diss the d in his music video for K to Survive. And in the video, he's seen wearing a hoodie, dissing many deceased members of No Limit Gang, including Kobe. So KTS Vaughn was their biggest op, constantly under NLMB skin. No Limit knew that they needed to get rid of Vaughn to stand on business. One day, Vaughn was walking down the street. As two NLMB members hopped out of the car and let shots off, Vaughn was hit multiple times and died on the scene. So NLMB's or No Limit Gang's biggest op was now out of the picture. And with this, Lil Baby and G Herbo began to actually focus a lot more on their music and would see a, a lot more success. They dropped songs like Kill Shit and garnered a lot of attention. And an extensive and successful music career would spark for both of them. However, the beef between No Limit Gang and KTS wasn't over. In 2021, one of G Herbo's closest friends, Lil Greg, was shot in the head while in a barbershop. A KTS affiliate was arrested for the murder but was released for a lack of evidence. Though KTS Vaughn had already met his demise, his brother Dre was still an active member. KTS Dre had claimed that the man arrested had nothing to do with the shooting, perhaps insinuating that he did it himself, as well as mocking the death. Dre was on house arrest around this time, and he'd violate his probation and would be arrested again, only to be put in jail overnight. His girlfriend and grandmother would pick him up from jail to take him home, and while they were walking to their car to leave, two cars pulled up with shooters and magazines were empty. It was rumored that NMB, or No Limit Gang let off 34 rounds into KTS Dre, definitely making the message clear. The deaths of the brothers, KTS Vaughn and Dre, were a major loss to KTS. They were, as I said earlier, big shots in the gang and uh, multiple bodies tied to their history. However, the beef wouldn't end there, and to this day, it has no sign coming to a close. No Limit Gang wasn't just active in the streets, they were also active in the music industry as well. For years, the crew was able to generate legal money. In 2017, Baby and his brother G-Money created their own record label, Grade A Productions. Juice World would begin to rap No Limit, even getting it tattooed himself. He'd claim the set on countless songs by rapping lines such as No Limit Gang, The Only Gang, Ain't No Other One. He'd even be comfortable enough to throw up the gang signs as well. Juice's role in No Limit would remain unclear, with no evidence tying him to any crimes. However, fans do speculate that he was used as a cash cow and a drug mule, possibly using his private flights as distribution. When he passed away, the police seized about 70 pounds of marijuana, six bottles of cocaine, and countless prescription pills. If you were alive today, he'd most likely have serious charges against him for trafficking drugs by flight. So before the fame, Juice World didn't have a heavy presence in the streets, but everyone in No Limit did. So perhaps he used the connections as protection, but anyways, rest in peace. Regardless of all of this though, No Limit has had a major impact in the streets of Chicago as well as the music industry, but that wasn't the only gang beef that would occur in the Chicago drill scene. In fact, there were beefs that were much worse and that go way further back into history. And Chicago's most infamous gang beef belongs to the notorious Black Disciples and Gangster Disciples. Many of the rappers we know and love from Chicago are in some way affiliated with either side. The crews date back to the 50s and 60s. 60 years later, BDs and GDs still have unsettled beef. And it's not getting better anytime soon. And the best way to exemplify that would be none other than a recent beef, one that stemmed from the Chicago drill scene but didn't happen during the era, and that is King Vaughn versus FBG Duck. Decades later, the bad blood carried over with King Vaughn and FBG Duck. FBG Duck comes from the south side, representing Flyboy Gang, affiliated with GD. Duck's music provides an unfiltered glimpse into the realities of the streets of Chicago. King Vaughn was a BD from O Block, while Duck was a GD repping 63rd and Tukaville two neighborhoods and sets with an elaborate beef. To summarize, someone off someone, then the other someone's off another set of someone's, creating a back and forth beef for years. And Vaughn and Duck would set up the stage to attempt to up the score on both sides. The beef started when King Vaughn and Memo 600 dropped their song Exposing Me, dissing dead associates of Tukaville and the opposing side. Vaughn would ruthlessly diss the other side with bars such as I swear I killed her, broke her back, talking about KI, who he was rumored to have 
taken off, as well as I'm tired of smelling Tuka and Lil Mark, and I'm tired of Scrap. So Vaughn had dissed multiple deceased members from the other side, KI and Scrap were even the family members of FBG. So Duck would stick up for his side and team up with Ruga to drop their own version of Exposing Me, dissing Oblock right back. Around the same time that remix would drop, Duck would go live on Instagram to share a story about Vaughn. Duck claims he and Vaughn were around each other when they were younger. He then claimed that Vaughn originally wasn't on Oblock's side. He'd run with both sides until FBG and his crew allegedly gave him the beats back in the day. His ass, Vaughn used to hang with us on Tuga Grade. His ass used to hang with us. His ass started hanging at Oblock, scare ass. But Vaughn wouldn't let that slide. Known for being very active in the streets and very loyal, he was never too nervous to poke out his chest. Even when he was younger, he was in and out of the legal system. So after this diss, he'd respond with a banger. The thing is, FPG Duck was more locally known. King Vaughn at the time kind of was too. However, he'd respond with his 2020 hit, Took Her to the O. The song conceptualizes King Vaughn going out with the girl, who also has ties to FPG Duck. He opens the girl's phone to see missed calls from her other man, Duck. The girl then meets up with an actor playing as Duck in the video, only to be met with violence. The actor playing Duck then realizes that Vaughn is outside, so he goes to confront him. The Duck actor would throw a brick at the window, then Vaughn would get out of the car to let some nerf pellets off, ultimately getting him gone. The verse ends with Vaughn speaking from the female's perspective, implying she doesn't care about Duck's passing or the fact that Duck was from 63rd Street. So King Vaughn really just made a hit song with intricate detail and some of the best storytelling we've seen in years in mainstream rap just to fantasize about getting rid of his enemy. But that wasn't the last time the two found themselves clashing heads, as they were still both big shots in their respective neighborhoods and sets. Duck would come back with his own response on I'm from 63rd. He'd start the song off by rapping, first of all, I don't know no stripper from Kankakee, and that in the video, he can't be me. Lil Jerk, why you send this little boy to play with me? Why you ain't do that yourself if you have something to say with me? Duck was responding to King Von's lines in his music and also dissing Lil Dirk, who had put King Von on, saying, why can't you do your own dirty work? Which was obvious, Lil Dirk had become a mainstream rapper. But what fans got from this was the disses were becoming more direct and the beef was only heightening, with neither of them backing down. King Von would then respond with many of his own lines declaring that he wanted all the smoke. Lines such as, that guy made a song go slide and he be hiding now, don't let us find out. And FBG Duck would not take this lightly and decided to come back aggressively, dissing as many Oblock associates as he could in his song Dead, which some consider to be one of the most disrespectful diss songs ever. He'd fire back with, I said I wasn't gonna diss the dead, but okay, I did it. FT Roy and OD, they dead. Yeah, I heard about J Money, he's getting done the same way. So in just three lines, he dissed three O Block associates, T Roy being Vaughn's longtime best friend, but that wasn't all though. He'd continue to diss 600 and Oblock members throughout the verses. And at this point, I guess something had to be done. And that's exactly what happened. Tragedy struck when FPG Duck was gunned down in daylight while shopping for his kids. The demise arrived just weeks after Dead Bitches came out. The ambush, captured on surveillance footage, shocked the city and sent shockwaves through the rap game. And rumor quickly hit the streets that King Vaughn was responsible for the hit. After the killing, Vaughn didn't exactly keep his mouth closed either. He and others in his crew leaned into the situation and implied that Vaughn was the one who called the hit. And in multiple songs, he'd make it clear that he was happy about the death. With lines such as, New crib came with cameras, duck got nailed, no hammers. To add salt to the wounds, Vaughn would even go on live and throw in some subtle disses as well. What's all on y'all good? Ain't no more FB. Another O Block legend, Boss Top, was also asked about the situation as well, and he didn't seem to be upset, which made fans believe that he implied the killing of FPG Duck was by the O Block army. But that wasn't all. Afterwards, on a call with academics, Vaughn was asked if he was saddened by the news of Duck's murder. Were you saddened by the news that he was murdered? Man, that shit hurt. I didn't go to sleep that night. Vaughn responded. This response is up for debate on whether or not Vaughn was being serious or not. Many speculate that he was being sarcastic and just turned the camera on for him to laugh, but I think it was pretty clear what he meant. Just a day after that call with academics, King Vaughn's life was taken as well. 
In the years that followed, internet investigators would tie Vaughn to multiple murders, a lot being from Vaughn himself. It turned out Vaughn was a very awkward combination of titles beginning with serial. He was not only a serial killer, but also a serial tweeter that would routinely self-snitch on himself. But I guess he got quote unquote lucky and uh, he won't be serving any time. By the beginning of 2024, more than three years after the murder, six men were convicted for the murder of FPG Duck, all being Oblox associates who wanted their get back for Duck dissing their deceased friends. In the end, around 10 people lost their lives either through becoming deceased or being locked up for close to life, all over a decades long beef that no one even remembers the start of. And it's kind of sad that kids looked up to these guys. However, all of these gang beefs wouldn't just lead to deceased artists. It would also lead to very long sentences as many of these artists were arrested. One of the most well known being the arrest of Rondo Number no. 9, who received a 39 year sentence for the 2014 murder of a driver, Javon Boyd. The then 19 year old was convicted of first degree in along with his accomplice, Courtney, who was sentenced to 38 years. On February 24th, 2014, Massey and Ely drove with the group to the city's Wentworth Gardens apartment complex to retaliate for an earlier shooting. The pair saw the 29 year old Boyd sitting in a parked car. They approached him on foot and fired several times before leaving the scene. Boyd had been waiting for a customer. He was later pronounced at Stroger Hospital. Massey was implicated in the crime by fingerprints left on Boyd's car and video surveillance footage. Rondo had an immense amount of potential, as he'd probably be on top of the Chicago rap scene if he were still free today. He was close with Lil Durk and would release music with them, and was spoken about in high regards by his fellow Chicago natives, but one crime ruined his entire life. Another Chicago drill legend, G Herbo, had been caught up with the law as well. This time, no violence was involved. Investigations found that from around March 2017 through November 2018, Herbo and his co-defendants were responsible for making tons of money through fraud. Mind you, this guy was already a millionaire off rap, he didn't need to do any of this. They had defrauded multiple businesses and individuals by using unauthorized and stolen payment card account information of real individuals. G Herbo would use this extra income to fund private flights, vacations, cars, designer puppies, and a lot more extravagant stuff he did not need. The fraud funded four different private jet flights for a total cost of over 80000 more than 34000 on car rentals such as a Mercedes-Benz 5560 and a Cadillac Escalade, and more than 14500 for a villa in Jamaica that they rented. He also used fraud proceeds to travel to various concert venues and to advance his career by posting photographs and slash or videos of himself on the private jets, in exotic cars, and at the Jamaican villa on social media and music videos, self-snitching at its finest. In 2020, G Herbo was indicted with five co-defendants. He was also charged with making false statements to an official in May of 2021. When the case finally got finished up in 2023, Herbo admitted as part of his guilty plea that he was responsible for 140,000 in victim losses. He ended up pleading guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and one count of making a false statement to a federal official. He was sentenced to three years probation as well as an order to pay restitution and forfeiture of $140,000 each as well as a $5,500 fine. G Herbo got lucky. He easily could have gotten many years in prison. However, you have to understand that during this time, his career could have done way better because if he didn't have the stress of facing years of jail time looming over his mental, who knows what would have happened. However, crime wasn't the only reason Chicago Drill lost his height. Another major reason which of course is also connected to crime of course, were the rampant deaths. One of the most famous cases is none other than Fredo Santana, Chief Keef's cousin, who was one of the pioneers of Chicago Drill's rap movement. His debut album, Trapinate Dead, is considered a classic and featured many prominent names including Kendrick Lamar. On the evening of January 19, 2018, Santana was found unresponsive by his fiance. In the days following his death, Santana told TMZ that the rapper died after suffering an intense seizure. The medical examiner report lists idiopathic epilepsy as the contributing cause of his death. Santana was diagnosed with a seizure disorder eight months before his death. Shortly after he quit the sedative Xanax, the report states, while he was regularly treated with the anti-epileptic drug Keppra, he still suffered from seizure episodes frequently every month that tended to appear as a cluster of seizures. He was pronounced dead the next day and he was only 27 years old. The news immediately hit the internet 
with almost every fan assuming that Santana died from an overdose. Drugs may have led him into a rough medical state, but he did not overdose. Chief Keefe would see all of the assumptions and urged everyone to stop speculating about his death. On Twitter, he stated that anyone who said his older cousin died of lean would be met with a case of the beats. And later, the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office ruled that the cause of Santana's 2018 passing was, in fact, cardiovascular disease. This wasn't a total shocker as Santana had spoken on his struggles with drug abuse on Twitter in 2017, connecting it to past trauma he had experienced in his life, writing, F being rock star is getting high, I got PTSD. In October of that year, Santana was hospitalized and diagnosed with liver and kidney failure. Addressing fans who had offered their support and well wishes, Santana said that he wouldn't wish this on his worst enemy. Ultimately, it got him. Santana wasn't the only person who overdosed or had a substance abuse related issue. Chicago drill was filled with all sorts of instances like this he just was the most famous case the next rapper that would fall victim to violence is leonard anderson or la capone up and coming rapper and close friend of lil dirk who was shot and killed in 2014 leaving a south shore recording studio his mother said the 17 year old rapper was walking through an alley near 70th street and stony island avenue around 6 25 pm when shots rang out and he was hit in his right thigh and lower back said amina greer a Chicago Police Department spokeswoman. After the shooting, fellow rapper Lil Durk tweeted, Get well, Lil Bro, but then followed it up with a later tweet of Rip Lil Bro after Anderson died at about 8.30 p.m. at Northwestern Hospital. According to a witness, after leaving the studio, Capone walked to the corner looking for his ride, wondering where his ride was at. Before long, he was on the ground and finished. But the most famous death was that of King Vaughn. On November 6, 2020, an up-and-coming Chicago rapper was one of three men killed Friday morning when a fight outside of a downtown Atlanta nightclub escalated to gunfire and police working in the area attempted to intervene. King Vaughn and his killers weren't even from Atlanta, but it proved that the lifestyles that these people had lived were boundless. In the end, three people were taken out, including King Vaughn, after a petty confrontation outside an Atlanta club. And the way it went down wasn't exactly pretty. Two off-duty Atlanta officers were working an extra job at a local hookah lounge when they saw two groups of men arguing with each other outside the establishment around 3.20 a.m. Friday, according to police. Officials said that the argument quickly escalated to gunfire between the two groups. King Vaughn would come out throwing hands, ready to scrap, but was unfairly water gunned down by Quando Rondo's minions. One of the off-duty officers, along with an on-duty officer who's patrolling nearby, confronted the shooters and shots were also fired during that encounter, which resulted in, you know. Worst of all, the fight started because of a petty disagreement and ended in death. Fans had been speculating that Vaughn was beefing with NBA Youngboy for quite a while, and this just solidified their belief. However, it also ended the beef. Youngboy, being Quando Rondo's close friend and associate, the beef supposedly kicked off when King Vaughn called Cap on Youngboy's music. Youngboy talking about on this song, bro. You talking crazy on this. As well as when pictures and videos surfaced of Vaughn hanging out with Youngboy's ex. Youngboy's ex would take to social media and downplay the situation by saying they were just working on music together. And King Vaughn would troll Youngboy further by playing his music on stream while singing along. All while Youngboy's ex followed by seemingly confirming that she was dating Vaughn. Youngboy would respond by posting a picture to Instagram. The caption would read, I'm gonna make sure that my your daughter since you trolling Then a snippet of a Youngboy song with Vaughn's ex, Asian Doll, had been released. So Youngboy was trolling right back. King Vaughn would respond through a series of tweets, but wouldn't seem to be hurt about the situation. Just the day before Vaughn's passing, he verbally confirmed that there was no beef. He said, ain't no rap beef, ain't no real beef, unless someone's got shot or something. Hell no, nah, ain't no rap beef. Oh, oh. What? Ain't no rap beef and it ain't no real beef unless somebody got shot or somewhere. It's kind of ironic how that turned out. Perhaps Youngboy and his associates took this as a challenge. Vaughn's crew and Quando Rondo's crew would clash outside of the club, where things took a turn for the worse, as I explained earlier. Vaughn was only 26, and he was clearly destined to be a rap superstar. Unfortunately, he never made it. The infamous and colossal beef of Lil Durk and NBA Youngboy would fall suit. However, it is important to note that the violence in Chicago has improved. During the past 10 years, on average, homicide numbers have ranged from 400 to 500. But between 1971 to 1981, Chicago's homicide rate was over 700 a year and peaked in 1974 with 970, the highest number ever recorded. However, in the 1970s, drill music was decades away from its birth. However, the murder rate was higher than it ever was when drill was still thriving. So this begs the question, 
Is drill music or was drill music really responsible for the heightening murder rates? Let's get into it. To further emphasize the nihilism inside of the Windy City, Chicago is known for the smoking on dead ops trend. They created it. I mean, Chief Keef was the first rapper to ever mention the word ops in his 2011 song, John Madden. From there, the word has seemingly been mentioned in songs over a million times. Disrespecting the dead would be a token way to ignite beef or push the beef further. Clicks and rappers will go back and forth dissing deceased enemies as a way to disrespect their counterparts. Smoking on Tuca would be a trending phrase inside of rap for years. Dissing a dead 15 year old who was brutally murdered in 2011. Other cities and areas would catch on to the trend and start to diss their dead enemies as well. The smoking on phrase actually stems from a story about Tupac. As a nod to his song, Black Jesus, his crew, the outlaws, confirmed that they rolled his ashes into a blunt and smoked it. In the song, Tupac raps that when he dies, he wants his homies to smoke his ashes. But not all rappers are proud of dissing the dead. Lil Jerk is one of the few to speak out against dissing the dead, though he has countless times in the past, and he vowed that he would no longer speak about those who have passed away in his new releases. Lil Durk opened a new chapter in his career, pushing a more complex and peaceful style of rapping. He's met with the Chicago mayor in an effort to lower the violence in Chicago streets. However, according to fans, this is highly hypocritical. But to Durk, he's dealt with so much pain and grief before turning 30 that he's over it and wants to spread a different message in his music that's not fueled by gun violence or worse. In a Rolling Stone sit down, Dirk even said, Even if you do 99% of stuff right, you still got 1% of the demons with you. You get angry fast, and one reply can mess up a billion dollars. That's why I'm not saying names no more in my music. I ain't speaking on the dead no more. None of that. Dirk explained, Violence has already ravaged his life so much that he doesn't want the same to happen with his six children. He's more focused on earning generational wealth and giving a better life to his family. I'm not chasing death no more, Lil Dirk said. I'm chasing a billion dollars. I want our kids to grow up safe and sound, to be able to have fun, to have a real life, something he never was able to do. In 2016, Chicago saw a spike in the murder rate. In 2015, 480 Chicago residents were killed. Just the next year, 754 were killed. In just one year, the rate had increased 58%. Studies have shown that due to the stoppage of police stop and frisks, the murder rates shot up. The protocol called for reasonable suspicion to stop and frisk someone, but obviously the cops, skin color, and the clothes you wear are all they need to profile you. But I mean, you know, it is what it is. The police might arguably influence a lower crime rate, but there's not much of an in-between. In the past 20 years, Chicago has paid over $700 million in lawsuits involving police misconduct, $143 million in just the past four years. So it's safe to say, Chicago police aren't exactly known for protecting Chicago citizens, but I do think they're doing their best. Finally, the last reason why Chicago drill faltered was that everybody left the city that it originated from due to how dangerous it was. And I can't really say I blame them. An artist's hometown is normally filled with fans, but a lot of the times there can be haters amongst that hometown crowd. For example, Chicago native Ruga is a highly respected rapper who came up inside of the Windy City. But once he had the means to leave the city, he relocated to the west coast and settled into the cozy hills of Calabasas. In a Vlad TV interview, Ruga addressed all the rappers that were dissing him for leaving a city and advised them to leave their hometowns whenever they could as well. He used the sad demise of Nipsey Hussle as an example. Someone respected and solid in their own city, as Nipsey Hussle, could still meet that untimely demise. In Nipsey's case, he was even trying to do good for his own community but they just wouldn't let it happen. Ruga said, you can't stay in the city you damn near from. That's where the hate comes from first, your own city. You gotta be a dummy to stay in your city. It even happened to Nipsey in his own city. Polo G, another Chicago rapper, has said the same in his Breakfast Club interview. DJ Envy asked him, how do you feel about the need to move out of Chicago to stay safe? Polo G responded with, and um, The climate of Chicago, like, feel me like I could be a I could turn around and be a billionaire. I could donate to 20 million charities. I can live in Hollywood as long as I want to, but when I come back to Chicago, it's still, they thinking of it from when you was, what, yep, still in the streets. Yeah. And he wasn't wrong. G Herbo even left Chicago for LA. I mean, even Lil Dirk himself, who calls himself the voice of the streets, moved away from the streets of Chicago years ago to escape the city. And of course, the man himself, Chief Keith left for LA once he was robbed in his own house and never looked back. But to me, these weren't actual reasons for why Chicago Drill is no more. These are just the effects of a very dangerous environment. Many people look at the Chicago Drill scene as if it's some type of reality TV show. 
For example, fans would dissect the drama that was being reflected in the music. People would do deep dives on the beefs and crimes of the rappers and cliques who were involved in the scene. Hey, kind of like this. And I mean, the tunes of Chicago Drill were a reflection of the struggles of their everyday life. It's just sometimes online reporters would exploit those reflections. DJ Academics, Warren Chirac platform brought many eyes to the Chicago lore of the violent streets. Academics would report on the news findings of the Chicago streets and broadcast it for the world to see. A lot of the time, he'd spark further violence and retaliation amongst the people being reported on. The thing is, these petty beefs, and often very serious ones, just don't tell the full story. To really understand the war in Chirac, you have to look at the actual history of the city's lower income areas. The racial wealth gap is the measurement of the income, saving, and asset gap between white households versus black and Latino households. Across the United States, white households earn on average 10 times more than black households and 8 times more than Latino households. This is especially demonstrated in Chicago due to the decades of astounding government policies and practices, leading Chicago to become one of the most segregated cities in the United States. In the earlier 1900s, government practices such as legislative redistricting redrew the boundaries for the Chicago housing market and school districts, along with exclusionary zoning laws and restrictive covenants. These government practices kept African Americans in Chicago limited to living only in certain areas and forming what is now referred to as the Black Belt on Chicago's South Side. The creation of the Chicago Black Belt, combined with the demolition of Chicago's housing projects, had a major impact on the city. Public housing demolition in Chicago led to the displacement of hundreds of thousands of black households. This, along with resident relocation strategy, led to the fracturing of dozens of Chicago street gangs, gangs that previously controlled the drug market within specific geographical housing settings, had now been relocated and engaged in turf wars to claim territory controlled by pre-existing street gangs in that neighborhood. Chicago housing policy, combined with Chicago law enforcement strategies, led to the arrest of seasoned ranking institutionalized Chicago gang members, leaving the Chicago street gangs lawless with no sense of order or structure. Younger gang members were left without structure and experienced leaders, and this displacement and targeted removal slash incarceration of higher ranking gang leadership predictably led to increased conflict, violence, and homicides across the city. Chicago drill rapper G Herbo accounted in a 2016 interview with The Breakfast Club that the heightened fear of violence that he experienced traveling home each night. So Chicago's historical policies and practices on poverty, housing, and gangs backfired and led to the physical and geographical increase in violence that still is felt across the city today. Black youth in the heart of Chicago are in poverty due to the poor education, high crime rates, and the lack of access to mentoring and other social support networks that might support personal growth. Families often spent years on the public housing waiting list and often accepted the first available opening. During this time, most Chicago housing project residents were black, single-parent, female-headed households. In the 90s, it was revealed that the Chicago Housing Authority was experiencing serious infrastructure and housing management issues, which included some serious maintenance issues, mismanagement of funding, and violence in the actual project communities. During the late 1990s, the Chicago Housing Authority, or the CHA, planned to gradually reduce the number of project-based housing assistant vouchers while simultaneously beginning to demolish public housing structures across the city. I think you can tell where this is going. The demolition of the public housing units impacted minority communities and further worsened segregation in an already heavily segregated city. In the 50s, the then mayor of Chicago, Richard Daley, refused to integrate or build public housing structures into non-black neighborhoods. Instead, Daley overpopulated public housing structures into predominantly black Chicago neighborhoods. Nearly all Chicago housing projects were built in communities with a 90% black population. The decision further reinforced racial segregation and the geographical and financial housing boundaries within the city. The CHA unveiled its plan for transformation in 2000. This plan led to the demolition and forced displacement of over 100,000 black residents. The plan for transformation included a relocation strategy for qualified residents, allowing them to use a low-income voucher to obtain a subsidy on qualifying existing housing. CHA had plans to serve only 15% of residents through the relocation strategy. Of the residents assisted by the CHA relocation strategy, 97% moved into other non-opportunity areas across the city. So all in all, this had a massive impact on the breakdown of black neighborhoods. And what was left of these neighborhoods were crazy. Or not crazy, but just not great. Because even after demolishing tons of housing units, the most infamous, at least until recently, project of Chicago stood. 
that being Chicago's Parkway Gardens, better known as O-Block, which would become a staple of Chicago's gang scene. O-Block gained its fame from its association with rappers and lore revolving around the crime and violence. The area has faced many challenges, but it also serves as a backdrop for the creative expression of local artists. The complex was the first to be cooperatively owned by Chicago's African-American residents, who experienced a housing shortage during the second great migration due to segregation. The first lady, or ex-first lady, Michelle Obama was a tenant, as well as many Chicago artists like Chief Keef, Fredo Santana, Lil Durk, and King Von. Many other notable artists and music producers have come from O-Block as well, with new generations always sprouting. In recent years, however, the complex has become the center of one of Chicago's most violent blocks. From the late 2000s to today, O-Block has become the center of gang shootings, mostly among teenagers and young adults. Tenants of O-Block and community leaders contested the crime wave after CHA demolished the drug-infested Randolph Towers, nicknamed the Calumet Building, which was once located at 6217 Calumet Avenue. The 16-story red brick project building was the base of operations for the Black Disciples Gang. In a 2004 Chicago Tribune article, it was stated that drug dealers in the Randolph Towers were hauling in drug profits as much as $300,000 per day. However, after the demolition of Randolph Towers in 2006, Black Disciples then shifted their operations to Parkway Gardens slash O-Block, which was at the time affordable housing for low-income families and had become gangster disciples territory. In the early 2010s, gang activity skyrocketed and Parkway Gardens became the center of one of Chicago's most violent blocks. The 6400 block of South King Drive, which was known locally as Wick City, but began to be referred to as O-Block after resident O.D. Perry was murdered. Under this new name, it has become nationally notorious due to former Parkway Gardens residents, rappers Chief Keef and King Von, and many more, whose music often references O-Block and its violence. Between June 2011 to June 2014, Parkway Gardens had the most shootings of any block in Chicago, Illinois. Many of these shootings occurred in 2011 and 2012, with city police reporting that violence at the complex has since steadily declined. It stems mainly from gang rivalries between the gangster disciples and black disciples, who both control territory near the block. The complex was added to the National Register of Historic Places on November 22, 2011, for its architectural significance and its role in the African American community development. In 2023, Oblock was sold, and it's not clear what the future holds for Oblock, but its history definitely goes beyond a price tag, especially in rap. So at the end of the day, the Chicago government wasn't exactly providing for its minority communities, and blaming all the violence on rap, which is what many of the city officials have done, is kind of crazy to me, even if it did contribute a little bit. So the takeaway from this is that an environment of oppression was created from factors outside of these rappers' control. But you may be thinking, hey, that explains some of it, but where did all these gangs come from? Well, they weren't anything new. Crime in Chicago has an insanely long history, and to understand this, we have to go centuries back. The first gangs in Chicago were created by mostly white guys in the late 1800s and early 1900s. A cycle of violence was then created and would be felt for a century plus, I mean to this day. In the 1880s, a thriving gang scene developed on the south side of Chicago. Several large Irish gangs such as the Dukies and Shielders exerted a powerful influence on the streets of Chicago. They would rob people, bite each other, and terrorize German, Jewish, and Polish immigrants who settled there from the 1870s to 1890s. These gangs fought constantly among themselves, but they united as the Mickeys to battle black gangs to the east. In the early 1900s, before the establishment of the Chicago Fire Department, decentralized localized fire brigades were common throughout the city and would often fight with each other as well as amongst themselves. In 1910, Big Jim Colismo founded the Chicago Outfit on the South Side, an Italian-American who created a criminal empire of racketeering, gambling, and prostitution. Even one of the most notorious gangsters of all time had a reign of terror in Chicago. Al Capone moved to Chicago in 1919 with ties to Big Jim. Capone began in Chicago as a bouncer in a brothel, but would later lead an empire of gambling, prostitution, bootlegging, bribery, narcotics, trafficking, robbery, protection rackets, and murder, leading to the formation of more gangs and the creation of a broader gang culture in Chicago. In 1966, in order to help increase recruitment and counteract threats from other groups, David Barksdale, or King David, created the Black Disciples Nation, which helped boost recruitment numbers into the thousands. In the 50s and 60s, Chicago was home to many job-providing industries, such as steel, glass, or meat, 
These factories would provide many jobs to the Chicago citizens, and around this time, there was a great migration from the South with many minorities moving to Chicago. Most would move to the South Side, where most of these industries were thriving. And in the years to follow, these industries would start to slow down, laying off most of their employees, leaving many people in poverty or on the streets, which led to, you know what. However, this isn't 2024. This was the 50s and 60s, where minority residents were already facing tons of hatred and unacceptance on top of economic struggles, even more than they do right now. These minorities would touch down and immediately be greeted by the influence of gangs. The state began to create laws that prohibited the sales or renting of housing units to minorities, as well as banks creating a hard environment for investing or saving money. And through facing so much hatred and oppression, the bullied would eventually want to fight back. Some members of black communities would band together and create cliques to fight back against their bullies. First came the Devil's Disciples, who would often find themselves beefing with racist white gangs called the Uptown Rebels. The Black Stone Rangers would also form, as well as the Miggy Cobras. One of the founding members of the Disciples crew, King David, who some actually believe inspired King Von's name. I doubt it though, I doubt it. King David would desire a more centered and powerful clique, so he set out to retrieve more members or recruit more members. He met with other Chicago crews and they'd all join together under the Disciples. This massive crew would become the Black Disciples. It would be long until they met a rivalry, the Supreme Gangsters, who would later become the Gangster Disciples when other crews joined their gang under the umbrella. All crews would clash heads and decades on influence would ensue. Nowadays though, people do have more of a choice whether or not to commit crime, but they still have generational curses that hold them back or pressure them into a life of crime and poverty. In 2011, Chicago reported that it was the home of around 150,000 gang-affiliated citizens, representing more than 100 gangs. Nowadays, the Chicago Police Department databases say that Chicago is the home of more than 280,000 people who are quote-unquote gang members. This was probably a lot to take in, but in all honesty, Chicago rap will never go away. It was just the drill scene that went out of style. Chicago is still one of the most respected and prominent areas for hip-hop culture, and I mean, it's still here. As the audience grew, the media attention and signing of drill musicians to major labels followed. After Chicago's drill momentum saw its roadblocks and detours, the sound witnessed a resurgence in the late 2010s and early 2020s with rappers such as King Von, Polo G, and a renewed Lil Durk who began singing. The drill sound never truly fell off, it just needed new artists to broaden its horizons. However, due to all the reasons I mentioned in this video, there's a lack thereof, if you catch my drift. But there were some mainstream moves, for example, Lil Dirk scouted King Von out and would take him under his wing, as they'd have an extremely tight-knit relationship, and King Von created waves in the music industry, Polo G had a progressive rise to fame, and has found himself making multiple charting hits as well. So, all in all, close to a decade after the sound's conception and rise, the Chicago drill subgenre was heard in every corner of the world, and has impacted rap culture in such a way that most subgenres never will. However, when speaking about, or looking at, or analyzing its downfall, you can't really blame the rappers or the scene. They were kind of cursed from the beginning, but hey, at least it happened. Or not really, it was pretty violent and messed up. I mean the music. Thanks for watching, my name is Rashad Fashir. If you're interested in watching more content like this, stay tuned. Goodbye.